All right, so this next article is we always start off with a fun article, and this is actually one of my personal favorites. A fan <laughs> of black coffee and dark chocolate, it's in your genes, a new study says. It's in mine, for Look sure. Oh, yeah, mine too, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I like both black coffee and dark chocolate, and they say it's because of a genetic variant that apparently we have that allows us to like things that are more bitter, and so because both black coffee and dark chocolate tend to be bitter, that's why we tend to um, want those things. But not just because they're mm -hmm. bitter, but because they give us a stimulant, you know, sure. as far and as like caffeine high, <laughs> shall yeah. we say. Yeah, and it was saying that like the association like with the bitter taste might actually just be like a learned thing. So, you know, psychologically we associate mm -hmm. this bitter taste with like that mental boost. So maybe that's why we like the black coffee specifically. And maybe that part isn't genetic. At least I want to say that because I don't really drink black coffee. Mm -hmm. So I'm still like wanting to be on the bandwagon. <laughs> but I mean, my dad likes black coffee and my mom likes dark chocolate. So I should have the genes. <laughs> and it might explain why I like right. mocha. Maybe you can evolve. Maybe, maybe you can maybe. get there. Or maybe, maybe I am like the, the mutated one and I, I am evolving. <laughs> well, actually for me, like I've drank coffee for a very long time now, way too long. And when mm -hmm. I first started drinking coffee, it was always full of milk, creamer, sugar. I wanted it to be super sweet because I like sweet things. Mm -hmm. But I was telling Georgia before the show, I did like 30 days a few years ago of eating really healthy and had coffee black for 30 days. And I got used to it. Mm -hmm. And so now I actually like my coffee black and then even like dark chocolate more now. So, there you go. But they yeah. do say it has health benefits. So Absolutely. that's the really cool thing, as long as you don't load it up with cream and sugar, that um, it's, it says it can, let's see, promote, uh, where did I find that? No, it's, well, where is it? to lower the risk of certain diseases, including oh, Parkinson's, heart diseases, type 2 diabetes. So when you're, and actually you find different types of cancer. So by drinking coffee, black coffee, you're I doing know. that. This is go. my excuse to drink. They say Absolutely. three to five cups a day, three which is a five. lot of coffee. Yes. Like I only drink like two maybe now. Yeah. So that's a lot of coffee. But anyway. And even dark chocolate is known in small quantities to have some um, health effects as well. So, you know, drink your yeah. chocolate. That's our drink excuse your, to drink, drink coffee. Drink your coffee, chocolate. eat your yeah. chocolate. You it's all good. It's we need someone who is prescribed to eat dark chocolate for blood pressure and they didn't really? even like it. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, how DNA is preserved in archaeological sediments for thousands of years. And so this is a study that they did of um, basically preserved sediment from different parts of the world to see if, because COVID's on and the pandemic's on, and they said, well, we've got these things we can work with since we can't travel. Let's, let's see if we can find DNA there. And that would allow us to kind of sample maybe who lived there, you know, what kinds of human, humans or hominins, as they say, uh, maybe animals that live there by looking at the DNA. And so they were able to find DNA in the sediments that are supposedly um, thousands of years old. So they say, good, now maybe we can study. You're a bit skeptical, though, on the quality of the DNA, right? The I'm skeptical in the sense of, can you find DNA? Sure. Is it right. in a quality in which you can sequence and find something usable? I have doubts because mm -hmm. DNA is very fragile. And proteins are much more stable. DNA is not. And so mm, I have my doubts. We'll see. They didn't, they didn't go into that in the article. So I don't know how much they've so got. It's interesting that, that, that they even think it lasts this long because from a biblical view, we'd say it's yeah. like, what, 4,000, 4,500 right. years old, which makes right. a lot more sense than saying it's like 400,000 years That's old. Right. right. So. And then the thing that, that cracked me up about, about the entire article, the title is, how DNA is preserved in archaeological sediments for thousands of years. They never answered that question. Like not even close. That's a good point. They yeah, never they did. Didn't. So kind of clickbait, I guess. They just answered that DNA is preserved, not how it's and preserved. And they assumed it's been there for Well, because they don't really know. I mean, years, honestly, yeah. to think about how DNA could be preserved, even if, because some of them believe it could be preserved for millions of years. Yeah. That's, that's really a stretch. They don't know because they find it in dinosaur bones. They do find that DNA is there. They, don't, they haven't tried to sequence it. No Jurassic Park. Um, they haven't <laughs> tried to sequence it or anything, but um, they know the proteins are there, and they can sequence the proteins, but again, they're more stable. So it, it's hard for them from a perspective yeah. to think about how this could have happened. Because really, so. it shouldn't. Those things, DNA, soft sediment, uh, remnants left over, those things should not last mm -hmm. more than really... Uh, hundreds of years after the creature's right. death, maybe thousands if preserved in if special preserved conditions, well. mm -hmm. yeah. but but no way millions. Yeah, and they're no really way. common though, so that's the really cool thing. I think from was, was it 2019? There was a report that 80, um, like over 85 reports of these like softer organic mm -hmm. tissues and. Um, materials that are found in like ancient right. fossils that would not that's be right. expected to last millions of yeah. years. So that's really cool. But they're there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. TikTok is enticing kids into having trans surgeries, take cross-sex hormones, child's, 
child advocates mourn. Okay, so this probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone um, that the, this is happening. Um, apparently, it's become a very um, common thing to use the hashtag trans. It's that those things with that hashtag have been viewed over 26 billion times. All right, so think about that for a minute. 26 and billion, billion times. B. And they said that, okay, their own figures reveal that children between the ages of four to 15 use the service TikTok for 69 minutes a day on average. Okay, so if you have a four-year-old, the only way that they can watch TikTok for 69 minutes a day is if you give them a device right. <laughs> that has TikTok on it, right? And, and that's one of the things I think we all thought as we read through this article was, where's the parental control? That's Why right. aren't parents controlling this when it comes to their kids? Well, mm -hmm. as our friend Patrick Marsh used to say quite often, mm -hmm. everything speaks. Right. And of course, there's a, there's a deliberate, straightforward message in a lot of these videos, but there's also subtle messages coming through as well. Mm -hmm. It says the videos that are supporting this transgender ideology on TikTok, it says such videos often feature young people documenting in a fun, lighthearted way the various stages of undergoing experimental hormones and irreversible body-altering surgeries that appear to make them appear more like the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And they make these videos, they're short, they're snappy, they're engaging to young people, and they make it appear like, oh, this is fun, this is lighthearted, this is, I'm having a great time doing this, there's no problems at all with this. And then also, they also make mention in the article that gender is seen as a new rebellion. Yeah. This is the new way you can rebel and be kind of the rebel in our culture. You can change your gender according to the secular ideology. And so it's presented that way. And of course, we know kids and teens are all about rebelling against what's considered the norm, mm -hmm. right? And so this is appealing to that. And actually, they're calling really this a contagion. This idea of transgenderism being normalized, it's really contagious being spread in, in real way through TikTok in a powerful mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it reminds me like what you're saying about just the amount of time really, really young people are spending watching these videos. It reminds me of um, in 2019, I believe there is a, a book by some Barna researchers, Faith for Exiles, that was published, and one of their main key findings was that, is that screens disciple. Right. So that's just like yeah. so that's important right. for parents to realize good, is that like <laughs> when you let your kids watch like whatever they want on social media or even even just like mainstream media for hours a day, okay, what kind of IV of indoctrination are you letting them be connected to? Kids have very malleable um, belief systems and they are going to be discipled by their culture. So even and if you take them to church I'm for like- still two things you just said. <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> IV of indoctrination they're connected to and screens disciple. Yeah, that's they that's do. really well said. And yeah. we're not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater here either because it's not that TikTok couldn't be used for good things. Oh, right. yes. Well, let me tell you about Answers in Genesis, <laughs> Canada's TikTok platform. We do have an account. It's actually gotten like more than twice as many um, followers as our YouTube channel. So it's doing really well, which is awesome. It's exciting to see young people connect <coughs> with this platform. And the nice thing is you can watch it without necessarily having a TikTok account or downloading the app. You can just go to the website, yeah. find us Answers in Genesis, Canada. We have scores of 60 second videos that talk about critical thinking and creation basics. So it's possible to use these things for good as well. Yeah. And you got to think about too, you know, I heard someone give this analogy one time that when you give your child a phone and it has internet capability, mm -hmm. you're giving them a, the ability to see images, read things of all sorts of different ideologies right there in the palm of their hands. Yeah. And as parents, you know, we need to be aware of that and, and take the proper precautions. Because think about it. Right. If there was a, a room in a building and in that room there are books of pornography or books of images of the transgender surgeries taking place or whatever, we would probably take those books out if our four-year-old right. was in that room, mm -hmm. right? Or get rid of them or not let them go in the room. So why would you hand them a phone? Right. Right, that has access to all these ideas right in front of them, right at the tips of their and, fingers. And I mean, I think it is important for parents. I mean, social media is here to stay. It's not going to go away probably right. anytime soon. So <laughs> it's important, especially when you have teenagers who are getting phones and are doing those things. And that makes sense. I mean, they're growing up, they're maturing. It's important that you have a role in helping them know what is, you know, what are the appropriate things, how much screen time, you know, those kinds of things while they're still in the home. Yeah. So you can really help them and educate them. And then when they get out under, from under, your care, so to speak, um, they can be wise about those things. Absolutely. And so it's all, it's right. all about that wisdom that you can impart as a parent to your child. Discipleship. Yeah, and this truly. is something that will, I mean, these, these trans, you know, surgeries and hormones and all these things, I mean, these are going to mutilate 
These are mutilating children. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're, they are really hurting them for the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. potentially. And so it, it, it's a trend. It's a fad, basically, but a very, very harmful one. Well, and the way they're presented, these ideas are presented as the answer to the, the problems of the teenager who's watching or the kid who's watching. Mm -hmm. This will answer all your problems. This is why you feel out of place. This is why you don't feel like you fit in the world. This is what's wrong with you. If you can just right. change your gender identity, your gender, you will feel better. This will give you all the answers you need for life. And it gives them none. Instead, it gives them problems for the rest of their life physically mentally psychologically all sorts of ways and what's so sad about that is we as christians we have the answers that people need that our kids need mm -hmm. right the answers to the problems of their sin and why they're broken why their thinking is busted we can explain mm -hmm. why that is from a biblical worldview mm -hmm. and the answer to that within the truth of god's word and through the gospel of jesus christ, jesus christ being changed from the inside out we've got the answers what are we doing with the answers? Yeah. Not only with the world around us, but with our own kids. Are we really equipping them and discipling them? And parents, we need to be aware, it's quoted in the article, that the message so often proclaimed in these videos is don't involve your parents. Yeah. Which is something we're seeing more of within our culture at large, within uh, school systems, don't involve the parents, do stuff without the parents' permission, et cetera, et cetera. So be aware that's a message they're getting. You'd be ready to counteract that and deal with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it goes back to the discipleship issue, the importance of teaching biblical critical thinking skills, like what you're saying, so that yeah. um, kids can recognize that this is like basically a big propaganda push. So uh, the social media uses these um, really psychologically persuasive forces like conformity. So, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. doing it. You should too. Also, just the power of repetition lots of studies have shown that like if you even if you know a message is true if you hear it over and over and over again or it, sorry even if you know a message is false if you hear it over and over it starts to sound true psychologists mm -hmm. call that the illusionary truth effect it's really powerful so just being able to teach kids to think okay wait a minute is a message true because it's popular on social media because um, lots of teens believe it because you hear it over and over no not necessarily uh, what we believe is true is based on what the Bible teaches so right. just teaching these skills super important super simple and it makes a big difference yeah. Amen. Okay, so this next one, I'm only going to show this image just real briefly because it's just very offensive, but it's left-wing Lutheran church holds a drag sermon for children to reflect on joy. So the middle person that you see there is the pastor of this church who decided to dress in drag for a, for a service that he gave. So I'm just going to um, block that image out now because it's just very offensive. But basically, yeah, so he decided to do this. It's St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Illinois. Logan, the Logan Square pastor, Aaron Musser, uh, decided to do this because he wanted to be an example showing that liberation from oppressive laws clears a path for joy. I don't even know what that means. What does that even mean? Yeah. That's, yeah, important to define the terms because people, if they want to change the culture and you want to shape truth to be whatever you want it to, it starts with redefining the language and using it very mm -hmm. flippantly like that. Mm -hmm. And that language, like oppression and that kind of thing, that has like some very Marxist leanings and that's what you can really see. There's several things going on here. They're definitely a very first, woke church. No oh yeah, about you, that. Can, <laughs> you can tell. And like, first of all, why is this a sermon to kids? Like, why is this not a sermon to seniors? Well, because again, kids are the future. They're the easy people to the disciple and they're the ones that are going to be the decision makers of tomorrow's society. So if you want to shape tomorrow's society with a worldview of your own invention, you have to target the students. So and that's one thing you see going on down here. Their throat. Repeat yeah, it again and yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, the last and these are church kids too, so like not yeah. even that many kids go to church anymore, so this is kind of an attack on the remnant if you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also seeing when a system takes over a culture in the sense, say new regimes coming in, if you look, think back to history, uh, when this has happened, they'll, one thing they'll do is they will target the kids, but then another thing that you start to see happening is as people begin conforming to the new ideology is a split happens in the church where you have one branch of the church that it becomes kind of the state-supported church and begins to preach the things that are expected in the culture. So that's what we see going on here versus, you know, hopefully there's that biblical holdout of churches right. that are still going to stand on biblical authority. But this is just an example of this is not the gospel he's preaching. He's showing that liberation from oppressive laws clears a path for joy. What laws is he talking about? Because he's breaking multiple biblical laws by doing what he is mm -hmm. doing. So he's saying biblical laws and biblical teaching must be oppressive. If it's oppressive, therefore it's it's not right. He's calling it immoral or not true. And this, by breaking biblical laws, is leading him to joy, to satisfaction in life. I mean, it's literally unbiblical in the highest degree. And one person said it like this. They're responding to what this guy did. This person said this. I'd say it's pretty sick that these people find joy in rebelling against yeah. God. 
And worse, this person continues, kind of quoting a Bible verse in here, but in worse, involving children in this sickness is a sure way to end up worse than a millstone tied around your neck and tossed into the sea. And just showing, really just referencing the importance of teaching biblical truth to our culture and definitely to our children. Yeah, yeah. And so, again, you know, it's sad because we see this transgender ideology being promoted. I mean, not only in the secular world where we expect it, but even within the church. And that's yeah. where it's really sad because people should know better. Um, and they're, again, choosing to rebel against God's word and, um, and, but still trying to call it Christianity. And by the way, if you look throughout the entire New Testament, there is a constant call for Christians to deal with false teaching within the church. So if we see stuff like this, we really need to be calling it out and calling these mm -hmm. people to repentance, to biblical truth. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that, like, within the church, because, like, where does this compromise start? Like, this church mm -hmm. cannot believe in a literal genesis and oh, do what yeah. they're doing. Oh, no. So yeah. just starting by compromising, throwing out those foundational chapters of the Bible, this is the kind of thing that it leads to because concepts like marriage and being male and female are founded in those original That's chapters. Right. Yeah. So... All right, these ancient marine reptiles got very big, very fast. So this is talking about ichthyosaurs, which are extinct sea creatures. They're not dinosaurs, all right, because they're in the water, right? So the right. only dinosaurs are on the land. And um, they talk about that they found, uh, you can see the guy there, That's he's by the um, skull, basically, of this creature. So it's pretty big. Um, they're kind of dolphinish like in their body um, and the way it looks, but they found this in Nevada and they're like, well, they're trying to understand like how they have such a big one. They've never found one like this, is the this big before. This by, the, by quite a bit, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty big. So they're trying to postulate, well, you know, maybe the conditions, you know, what, how did it get, in other words, how did it evolve, which is what they're gonna to learn, so they use the word they're gonna use so yeah. fast to be so big. Well, the thing is, is it got me when I was reading the article, it said that it, comparing it to ichthyosaurs that lived earlier and that lived at the same time. So it's just a big version of an ichthyosaur. I mean, at the same time as smaller ones. That's yeah. not evolution, <laughs> right. people. Yeah. That's just variation. Variation within a created kind, which is what you'd expect understand. within a biblical worldview. That's so, right. Yeah. 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 And so they're really, the whole article is trying to figure out how did these things evolve so quickly they evolve to be bigger. And they're thinking because whales took a much longer period of time to evolve to be bigger. And right. these did it much quicker. And they're thinking about within the biblical worldview, uh, these ichthyosaurs of various sizes are just showing variation within the mm -hmm. created kind, buried during Noah's flood. Makes really good sense within the biblical worldview. And uh, it's interesting to me as you read the article, if you've never looked at the idea of whale evolution, it is a hoot, all right, to kind of look at and see what they suggest for this ideology, because they're going to suggest that ichthyosaurs are branched off in some way uh, from that same line of whales. And within that whole line of thinking, they suggest an evolutionary ideology that, you know, of course, life comes from non-life, evolves to simple single-celled organisms, to bottom sea dwellers, to fish, amphibians, and then reptiles and mammals, and things go on land. But then at some point, some land animals got unhappy with being on land, and they went back into the water and evolved there to be wells and ichthyosaurs and so forth. So the evolutionary thinking here is that things evolved out of the water, some went back into the water. I mean, it is a mess when you really kind of break it's it down. It's a whale of a story. <laughs> oh, buddy oh, would be so proud of you right now. I got the pun in, so I had to say that. I had to say that. <laughs> And it's like what you're talking about is that change between kind scenario of evolution, what we'd normally think of as being evolution, but then what you're actually observing here is variation, in this case, within the ichthyosaur kind in terms of size. And they're calling that evolution, but that's just variation within kind. So using evolution in the same way for very different things, um, change within the size of something is not how you're going to get new types of body structures and that new level of information required. So calling them both evolution is what we yeah. would consider to be a bait and switch fallacy because they're using two very different words in the same sense, basically. So yeah. just so you know, I'm not making anything up. Here's a direct quote from the article. It says, both groups, the well group and the ethosaurus, evolved from land dwelling animals that returned to the sea, developed similar body plants including powerful tails to propel themselves through the water and in some cases grew to normal sizes. Yeah. Well, and evolutionists don't believe that speciation can happen quickly. Now, I'm not saying this is a new species, but I'm saying that in their view, it takes millions of years for things to change. But reality is it doesn't. I mean, all of the species that we have today came from the kinds that were on the ark, <laughs> um, which is probably fewer than 7,000 animals. So you can get speciation really quickly under right. the right conditions. And so I think that's another part of their issue that they're struggling with on this. They also found in the article and doing the research with where they found these particular ichthyosaurs that said the environment, the ecosystem which they found them seems to be well-preserved, stable, and well-functioning. 
which was kind of surprising mm -hmm. to them, but we expect there to be a well-functioning ecosystem right. pre-flood pre and then post-flood even yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So it makes sense in a biblical worldview. Okay, Bronze Age migration may have brought Celtic languages to Britain. Or Where's Celtic. Bodhi when you need them? Is it Celtic or Celtic? Celtic Anyways, yeah. okay, yeah. So they're basically talking about analyzing DNA and understanding um, how populations have moved in and out of different areas. And um, between Europe and France and Pakistan and Bulgaria and all of those sort of European nations over there and even some Asian nations. So was it during the Bronze Age? Was it during the Iron Age? Was it, you know, when did this happen? How did this happen? And it can be very confusing from a genetic standpoint because we do have a lot of people, you know, moving here, moving there, you know, yeah. marrying. And, and so you have them coming in and then they move out and they take that DNA with them, obviously, That's everywhere right. they go. So it can be really confusing to sort of trace all of that and figure all of that out. But I think what the article really showed was overall, okay, that people were much more mobile than they thought. Yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting quote I found is that how the researchers say that large sectors of society were on the move. And they found that surprising, but from a biblical view, we would not consider that surprising mm -hmm. because we would expect there to be lots of migration post Babel as people are spreading out around around the world to different sections. Yeah, throughout history migration as well for numerous mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jeetan has a book coming out yeah. very soon. I forget the title. Traced. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, change the trace. So it's showing really the tracing of the human lineage over time and tracing that through DNA. Yeah, uh, through the Y chromosome, cool. I believe it's really well done. It's very mm -hmm. powerful research, mm -hmm. and it's really intriguing. I've read the book, or at least the first version of it, and as you read through it, he's connecting so much of the spread of genomes over different areas through historical events. And yeah, you can cool. see where when a war takes place here, people leave there and go here mm -hmm. historically, right. and we can it's say, trace that mm -hmm. genetically. That's really and cool. And so it's yeah. really cool to kind of put all that together. Be look, be on the lookout so for it'll that. It'll be book. coming Traced, out later this year. Soon. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, darkness caused by dino-killing asteroids snuffed out life on Earth in nine months. All right, so this is another story article. It's going to talk about the Chilux Chicxulub um, crater, which was caused basically by this giant asteroid that banged into Earth, you know, between 145 million to 60, no, 66 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. Well, at least the non-avian dinosaurs. I love that. The right ones that the didn't bat, involve, you know, into birds. Um, and this, later. Is on, this is on video, correct? Yeah. Because so, they're very dogmatic about how So they see this crater and they think that it's caused by this asteroid. And when it hit, they basically did studies to show that because of all the... Um, the burning that took place and all, you'd have all this soot in the atmosphere. And so it would have caused the sunshine not to be as bright on earth. And so photosynthesis would have stopped. Cooling and so things don't have plants to eat and they die and lots of stuff died out. And I'm like, okay, we can explain that from a biblical worldview, though. That's right. That same evidence we can explain very, very differently. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Because we expect that during the flood, the fountains of the great deep are, they burst forth. That literally means you have the cracking of the Earth's crust, moving the Earth's crust catastrophically. That's going to cause volcanic activity, uh, tsunamis, all sorts of stuff taking place. With the volcanism happening, you're shooting dust and aerosols mm -hmm. into the sky, blocking sunlight literally all around the globe. So yeah. we expect that cooling feature as a result of the effects of Noah's flood. And then with the lava flows pouring into the oceans, the ocean will be very warm, atmosphere will be cool. That gives you the perfect conditions for a post-flood ice age. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it makes a lot of sense what we see versus what the Bible says. It matches really well. Mm -hmm. And um, just how they are talking about... Um, the crater impact, like creationists as well, would view from what I've read, at least on a website and stuff, that that would have happened around the same time as the flood. So again, this is just another um, event that's happening that's causing a lot of climate change or changes in mm -hmm. the environment, Real like shortly change, after, yeah. yeah, shortly after the flood, mm -hmm. and that would have dramatic impacts and lead to some of the extinctions. Might help explain like why we don't see a lot of dinosaurs around today, even though we know that they would have survived the flood on the ark. So yeah, just, it's just another way of looking at it, but we, of course, would interpret it from a biblical view, which makes exactly as much sense from yeah. what we see in the world around us. And not to mention that during Noah's flood, the slate was wiped clean, mm -hmm. right? The world was utterly destroyed. Yeah. And so at the end of the flood, you got a brand new start for vegetation, for things, uh, li living things after they get off the ark, going different places, leading to rapid speciation, by the way. Right. But dogs say dogs, cats, yeah. cats. And so all of that fits within the biblical worldview. And the more we look at real science, the more mm -hmm. it confirms it again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so because I'm the anchor, I'm skipping the next article, and we're going to the last one because right. I wanted to talk about this. Um, so yes. 538, which is a basically a website that does news that's affiliated with ABC News, right. asked for people's abortion stories on Christmas Day and got a bunch of stories of people choosing life instead. So this is one of these really cool things 
that, that happened on social media where they're yeah. wanting people to share, you know, of all days, right? On Christmas Day, they want people to share their abortion stories. And instead, people got on and shared very different stories, stories of life, stories of how Love maybe it. their mother yeah. was considering abortion and then did not have an abortion or a sibling that was maybe disabled or thought to be disabled and then wasn't. And so it's all these stories of life, which is just awesome, right? That they did, that people did this on social media gives me some hope. <laughs> just, yeah, just a few examples. This one says, my father-in-law was born poor and black in a rural area. His mother tried to abort him, but the procedure failed. He went on to be a pastor. Uh, and now he is, he's lifted up other countless lives. He has had four, four children, nine grandchildren, six other great-grandchildren, and a wonderful legacy yeah. Uh, yeah. because of life. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you keep going down, uh, you know, these different people giving testimonies that my doctor told me to have an abortion, but I didn't. And now I've got a beautiful child right. as a result. Right. And, uh, uh, and there's some really profound ones. Some were kind of snarky, but there were a lot. There are a lot of good messages yeah. coming through this. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Common themes of people who are thankful for the life that they have from not being aborted, or people yeah. who are thankful for the lives of their children that they didn't abort, um, as well as some um, women and men actually sharing the negative effects of abortions that they did have and how they're still haunted by that. So all That's these right. stories, though, um, it's just encouraging. Like you said, for me to see yeah. people sharing these stories. Um, we were actually having um, a discussion. A bunch of the young adults within Answers in Genesis, and we were talking about how important storytelling is mm -hmm. as a way of communication uh, for a number of reasons. It connects with people psychologically. Obviously, Jesus knew that. He invented the human mind. He used stories all the time to communicate. Mm -hmm. And it helps overcome opposition, not only because of that psychological connection, but also because people can't argue with your own life story. And storytelling is just a great way of engaging with youth and young people, especially uh, with our entertainment culture. Youth are very just used to, we're kind of acclimatized to being entertained and it's an engaging way to share messages. So I would just absolutely encourage people, we need more testimonies and more stories like that. It's a practical way of but, pushing back the dark. Yeah, but we need to be careful, and just a warning and not to down things on this, okay? Yeah. But um, one, of the, one of the people said this about their sister that was born with a congenital heart defect, and now she plays the piano, and she does all these wonderful things, right. and she says she is a constant reminder that all babies deserve life. Okay. That is not the reason, though, that all babies deserve life. Not because, you know, she got that defect fixed and she can play the piano. That's not the reason. Which is she great, it. but that's it's not great, the fundamental reason. But it's life not an ultimate argument, right? right? Because Hitler could come along and say, well, we had to spend money, or, or somebody who say, might say, well, we had to spend money to be able to fix this child's heart, and yeah. that costs money, and, you know, we don't want to do that. Like, we should have just let her die, and, and you know, so who's right, right? And that when you're using a very, what we call utilitarian argument, right. we need to be using an ultimate argument. And the only ultimate argument is the Bible, right? When we start with that, we see that all babies deserve life because all babies are made in the image of God. That's it right. doesn't matter if they can play the piano, they become Mozart, they become a genius, whether they live one minute, right? Or they live 80 years. It's that's, that's not the point. The point is that they are image bearers of God and that is why they deserve life. Exactly right. So yeah. we can use some of these other arguments to kind of, to talk about different things, but it can't be the ultimate foundation we are leaning on. It's got to get back to God's word. Right. God says, because truly, as we often say in the ministry, it always boils down to this. It's God's word versus mm -hmm. man's. Mm -hmm. Who's the authority? Either God's word is, you build your thinking from there, or you reject God's word, and then man's ideas become your ultimate authority. Yep. And so if we don't go to God's word, we're appealing to really just another man's ideas, and then that's pretty arbitrary because you're arguing between different people about their opinions on something, but who cares about man's opinions? What does the ultimate truth found in God's word actually say? Yep. And so we we'll always go back to that foundation. I, I did like this tweet, though. There are a couple of really clever ones. This one was really good. This one said, here's a story. Every Christmas, we celebrate the unexpected birth of a child that saved the world, yeah. which I thought was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And then one more said, 50 years ago, seven unelected justices invented a right to abortion that yeah. doesn't exist in the Constitution. Since then, more than 65 million unborn human beings, I would add made in God's image, have been killed. Abortion harms everyone, solves nothing. There's your story. Yeah, that's and, true. And it is so true. The effects are so consequential. And again, to deal with it, we got to stand on God's word. Yeah, and a couple, of, just before we end right here, I know we're out of time. So a couple of resources. Um, so Quick Answers to Social Issues, which Brian Osborne here has <laughs> authored. Yeah. And it's a great, it talks about a lot of the things we've been talking yeah. about today with abortion and homosexuality that's and right. transgender. So I highly recommend 
that. Also, the Gender and Marriage War, which yeah. a lot of us have chapters in. Um, and it's a great book to really, again, talk about these transgender issues, talk about homosexuality, talk about, you know, all of that. And, and again, from a biblical worldview, how Sorry. do we do that and do that well? Well, we are out of time for today, so we'll see you back on Wednesday. See you guys.